to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the Apostle Paul said, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you, these are the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 37. Welcome to our study of the inspiration of God's Word. When we talk about the Bible, are we talking about a book from men, book just passed down by oral history, or are we talking about a Bible, a book from God inspired by Him and written to help man get to heaven? These are indeed very important questions that each of us must look to the Scripture to determine. As always, we welcome you to our study today. If you've got a Bible question or if you've got an issue maybe that you've been thinking about or studying about, we encourage you to write to us or email us or you can visit us on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible study material. We'd love to make those available to you either in video format, digital format, or on a DVD. And as always, we encourage you to visit the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, in your area. You'll find people who love the Word of God and are indeed concerned about lost souls. Today we think about the inspiration of the Bible. Is the Bible really from God? Is it of divine origin? And can we know know for a fact that this book is God's message to mankind today. The psalmist said in the long ago, in Psalm 119, verse 160, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. The Bible does make the claim that it is, every word of it is from God and of divine origin. But you know, as we think about this subject, we begin by asking, why is inspiration so important? Why is this a subject that we need to discuss? Well, a lot of times, people will think about the Bible as a good book, a book full of good moral or religious stories or suggestions, but not necessarily a book of which we must give utmost importance to our soul. Think of the words of Jesus in John 6, verse 68, as He spoke with His disciples and as He taught them about God's truth, Jesus there taught in John 6, verse 68, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus has those words of eternal life. The Bible tells us in John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, if you don't receive my words, if you reject me and don't receive my word, you'll have that which judges you. The word that I've spoken will judge you in the last day. And so this is the words of eternal life. The Bible is the message I'm going to be judged by, not just a book of good moral suggestions. It's God's final message of salvation to mankind. Why else do we need to study the Bible? We need to look at Bible inspiration and study the Bible because there's so much evolution and humanism that's being taught in our schools and throughout our media worldwide. The Bible says that God created man. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The psalmist said in Psalm 19 1 that the, the heavens declared the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. We need to realize that we must honor our Creator in the days of our youth. Ecclesiastes 12, verse number 1. And so, our humanism and evolution, the path we need to go down, or is the Bible and its message of how we came to being and what our purpose is, the path we need to follow. Those are questions that if we can understand inspiration, we'll have the answers to. Also, we need to study Bible inspiration because there's so much 
religious skepticism and confusion about the Bible. I hear religious people talk and sometimes their message is rather confusing on the Bible. They'll say, well, the, the Bible says this and history says this and we combine the two and we get a, a real message. Wait a minute now, is the Bible alone God's inspired word? Are we to pick and choose what we like and what we don't like and take certain passages out and use certain passages? Or is all of it inspired by God? The Apostle Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And thus, when we think about religious matters, we need to look to the Bible and ask, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37 verse 17. What does the Scripture say? Romans 4 and verse 3. And then, of course, we want to look to Bible inspiration because there is so much sin, ungodliness, and immorality in our world, and the Bible has the answer to that. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What about subjects that are so confusing or subjects that are hot morality topic, topics today? Who has the answer on those? When it comes to marriage and divorce, God's Word has the answer on that. When it comes to subjects like homosexuality or subjects like abortion, God's Word has the answer on those moral subjects. And if I can be convinced, if I can understand this book really is from God, it's 100% inspired by God, I want to give my heart to thinking about what God says on these very important moral subjects. For a few moments, let's turn our attention to what the Lord Jesus Christ taught on the subject of inspiration. What did Jesus teach and believe about inspiration Himself? Did He view it? as the Word of God? Did He view it just as moral suggestions or is it the final binding truth from the Almighty? Here's what Jesus taught. Jesus, first of all, believed the Scriptures were absolutely of divine origin. Notice Matthew chapter 22, verse number 43. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord. Notice those words. David in the Spirit called Jesus, the Messiah, Lord. Quoting from the Psalms, he emphasized the fact that David was being inspired by God and that what the psalmist said was of divine origin by the Holy Spirit. Friend, when we look at Jesus' view of Scripture, he viewed it as from God, as absolute truth and as binding on men and women today. You know, when we think about Jesus' view of the Scriptures and inspiration, Jesus believed that they were full and complete and that they were indestructible as God's message to mankind. Let me give you another illustration. Look in Matthew chapter 5 and notice verses 17 and 18. Jesus here said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus said, I didn't come to the Jews. He says, I didn't come to destroy your law. I am the fulfillment. I'm the climax of that law. I am the Messiah. And then he said, not one jot or one tittle will be destroyed, will be broken till all is fulfilled. Jesus believed that the scriptures were full. They were complete. That he was the fulfillment of everything God had planned throughout time and history. You know, as we think about Jesus and his view of scripture, there's a beautiful passage which illustrates the belief Jesus had in the fullness and, and the truth of Scripture. John 10 verse 35, Jesus clearly taught the Scriptures were infallible and they were without error. Notice the words of Jesus. Jesus said, 
if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and notice this parenthetical statement, and the scripture cannot be broken. Now Jesus is just quoting an Old Testament passage used ad hominem to show that the scriptures, even they were using them uh, to show certain things and that the scriptures were from God. But notice that little statement. And the scriptures cannot be broken. What's Jesus saying? They're infallible. They're perfect. They're from God. They're absolute truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You know, when we think about Jesus and His view of Scripture, Jesus believed it was the final authority from God. Let me give you an illustration. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is there being tempted by the devil. And the devil uses or tries to use Scripture against him. And three times, Jesus counters the devil's temptation by saying, It is written, it is written, it is written. What did Jesus do? Jesus went to the Word of God as the final answer, the final authority, and as the sum of God's truth on those subjects. Friend, that's our view. That's the way we want to view Scripture today as God's final message, as absolute authority. Do you remember what Jesus said? Matthew 28, verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, friend, as we think about Jesus' view of Scripture, not only did He believe it was from God, that it could not be broken, that it was the final authority, Jesus also put His stamp of approval on the fact that it was historically accurate. You know, sometimes people question some of the stories, some of the, the historical stories of the Bible. Maybe, for example, like Jonah. They might say, well, Jonah... You know, that's a great story, great message, good. They might view it as a fable, but not really swallowed by a big fish and those things never happened. Or, or maybe things like Noah, a great earth, a global flood and a man building a boat and his family staying on that for a prolonged period of time and they replenishing the earth. Good idea, good message, not really historically accurate. How did Jesus feel about those two incidents? Well, notice what Jesus did say about each of those. For example, in Matthew 12, verse number 42, Jesus said this, The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came to the, from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. And she go, Jesus goes on in that context not only to mention Solomon, but to mention Jonah as well. Just as the Son of Man is going to be in the earth, just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the earth. Solomon and Jonah both are confirmed as true stories, true messages from God as historically accurate. Well, what about Noah? Notice another usage of Jesus when he mentions Noah. For example, in Matthew 24, verse 37, Jesus said this, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the, son of, the coming of the Son of Man be. What do we know about Noah? Jesus likened his coming to the days of Noah. Did Jesus believe Noah and Jonah and Solomon were all true events? He absolutely did. And so he put his stamp of approval and verification on the fact that the Bible was historically accurate and from God. But you know, when we think about things like, even things like creation, some things that go back to our origin that deal with the science and the truth of creation, there's a lot of people who question whether or not God created the world in the way He did. And was man created in the beginning or did man evolve over a long process? Friend, Jesus also, by implication, taught that the scriptures concerning their origin and their scientific truth were from God. Notice these words that Jesus uses. Matthew 19, beginning in verse number 2, Jesus says this, And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, 
Have you not read? Now notice this. Have you not read? He who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What was Jesus' view of, of Genesis 1? Genesis chapter 2. The origin of man. The foundation of the home. Jesus believed that it happened at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus recognized the truthfulness of the fact that Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God breathed in the man the breath of life, and man became a living being. And that from the rib of Adam, God made Eve, and the two were to become one flesh. At the beginning, Jesus said, God made them male and female, showing he taught and he believed that the scriptures all the way back to the beginning were inspired of God and accurate. But not only did Jesus teach that, Jesus taught that the scriptures were indeed factually inerrant. That is, they do not contain the errors that so many claim they contain today. For example, when Jesus prayed to the Father, in John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Now notice this, your word is truth. You know, there's a question asked by Pilate in John 18, verse 36 through 38. What is truth? Jesus had already answered that. Jesus clearly believed and taught God's word was truth. Now, I want to give you another example, another illustration from Jesus' life. Matthew 22. Verse number 29, Jesus said basically the same thing as He said in His prayer to the Father. Notice these words. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Now the context is, the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, tried to put Jesus in a quandary, tried to put Him between a rock and a hard place. They've got this man who had a wife or this woman who had seven husbands and in the resurrection they want to know of Jesus whose wife will she be and Jesus of course says in heaven there's neither marrying nor giving in marriage but then he points this out to him and he says you're wrong you're greatly mistaken and here's why you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God what was Jesus teaching the scriptures aren't full of errors they contain the truth and you missed this truth, and that's what makes your doctrine not in accord with the teaching of Almighty God. But you know, as we think about more of Jesus' teaching on inspiration, we also realize that Jesus believed the Scriptures would provide absolute spiritual clarity or insight. That is, that they contain everything to help man know what he needs to know to please God, get to heaven, and know truth. Do you remember Luke chapter 24, verse number 45? Two men are walking down the road to Emmaus. Jesus begins to discuss Scripture with them. And the Bible tells us that as He opened the Scriptures to them, they realized their truth and their hearts burned within them, knowing and recognizing that truth. Jesus simply taught the Scripture to those two men. And that scripture caused them to have a burning within their heart, realizing what truth was and the importance of it in their life. And so he taught it, provided spiritual clarity, and that it was everything men and women needed to get to heaven. I want you to think about an example from the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Luke chapter 16, verse number 31. Notice these words. Jesus said, but he said to him, to the rich man, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one were to rise from the dead. The question the rich man asks is, I've got five brothers. This is a place of torment. I don't want them to come to this place. Please send somebody back from the dead and warn them about this. And Jesus said, No. If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't hear one though he were to rise from the dead. What was Jesus teaching? Moses and the prophets, they were all sufficient to warn people about the impending destruction and doom 
of those who don't obey God. And so Jesus not only believed they were truth, He believed it was everything man needed to know about heaven and hell, salvation, life, how to please God, and how to get the most out of a relationship with the Almighty. But you know, as we think about Bible inspiration, not only do we understand Jesus' view of inspiration, that He recognized that was from God and everything man needed, but we also realize that the very nature of who God is will confirm Bible inspiration. Let me illustrate it this way. Is it the case that our God, the God of the Bible, is a God of truth and that what He says is true? Well, indeed so. And the Scripture confirms this. Notice Romans 3 verse 4. The Bible says these words, Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Paul affirms, God is true. Whether men like it or not, God's true. Let every man who opposes that be the one who is a liar. What do you know about God? He's true. Now, think about this. If God is true and if the Scriptures are breathed out by God, remember 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration is a compound word in the Greek language. It's the word theos panustos, and that is the word panustos literally means to exhale or to breathe out, and the word theos means God. And so that compound word literally means God exhaled. He breathed out, and on His breath were the words of Scripture. And so think about this with me. If God is true, and if the words of the Bible are breathed out by that God, then, friends, Scripture is true. It is absolutely 100% founded on the character and nature of Almighty God. Now, let's just back up and think about each of these ideas again for just a moment. In the Bible, we indeed are taught that God Himself is a God of truth. Let me direct your attention to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse number 10. The Scripture says of Almighty God in Jeremiah 10, verse 10, these words, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. The Lord. He's the true God of all the gods that the Gentiles may have had. He is the one true God, the God of truth. But not only is He the real God, the true God, the Bible also affirms, unlike men, our God does not lie. He is incapable of that. Titus 1 verse 2 says, We're living in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie not only is it something He won't do, it is impossible for the very nature of God to be God. It's impossible for God to be God and lie. And so God cannot lie. Let me give you an illustration again from the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 23, verse number 19, says this of God. The Bible records, God is not a man that He should lie nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Even the most upright men sometimes have to deal with fallibility. All of us have to deal with sin and fallibility, not God. God is not a man that he can lie. That's the very nature of God. He is absolute truth. And so the, the first idea that God is true founded upon Scripture, seen in nature, everything that we look at. God's reliable and trustworthy. Well, is it true then that the Scriptures are from God? The same God that we learn about in the Bible indeed tells us it is true. 2 Peter 1 verse 19 following, the Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God confirms that the men who spoke and wrote the Bible were under His direction in every way. 
And 1 Peter 4.11 says, If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, God is true. The Bible is breathed out by God. Therefore, the Bible is absolute truth. Psalm 119, 160 again says, listen to this beautiful passage. The entirety of God's Word is truth. When we look from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, what do we know about the Bible? The entirety of it is absolutely true and inspired from God. Friend, as we think today about some introductory matters related to inspiration. We want to walk away knowing that both Jesus taught and the very nature of God demands that the Bible is His Word. I don't want to approach the Bible with a half-hearted, lackadaisical attitude to it just being uh, another good book among other religious books. No, that's not the mindset we approach the Bible with. I want to approach the Bible with the mindset of Saul of Tarsus. Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. I want to approach the Bible with the mindset of the words Jesus' mother used when she spoke to the servants in John 2, verse 5. Whatever He says to you, do it. That's our attitude. That's our heart. This book is from God. I want to study it, I want to know it, I want to live my life by it, and I want to let it be the guide and the direction in every area of life. Now, friend, we, we also want to consider, and want you to consider, that this book is the only book that can tell you how to get to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Do you know for sure today that you're going to heaven? If not, here's what the Bible teaches. You can believe Jesus is God's Son. John 8, verse 24. Having believed that, you can turn from sin and repent. Luke 13, 3. Confessing Jesus as God's Son. Romans 10, verse 10. And being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, you can become a Christian. Mark 16, 16. May God help each of us to study His Word and truly believe it is inspired of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.